All right, everybody, for today's critical thought, we're returning to the topic of morality and why it can be so difficult to do it justice when it comes to video games, whether it's from a narrative point of view or a design. And the game that kind of sparked this discussion would be playing Vampire, which from Don't Nod, the developers behind uh, Life is Strange, that dealt also with morality, but in that game more from a storytelling rather than from a specific gameplay point of view. But morality when it comes to video games has been an effective part of RPG-based titles since the 90s. We even go back further with the very first pen and paper style game. So then you choose your alignment, you know, chaotic, neutral, lawful, evil, and all that great stuff. But for the mainstream uh, video game consumers, the first games to really explore the idea of morality or player choice came with the Bioware style RPGs, Knights of the Old Republic, Jade Empire, Mass Effect, and so on and so forth. And since then, it became a very big marketing push for a lot of open world style games, be it from the Elder Scrolls series to the latest Fallout games, and of course, many titles like Grand Theft Auto, and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting all the various third-person open-world adventure games that came out during the last decade that had morality or choose the fate of so-and-so and so on and so forth. The problem, though, is that when it comes to defining morality in video games, it never really feels right. And the problem has to do with the abstraction, I guess, between good and evil. Now... When we talk about using morality in game design, there's two popular aspects. There is from a story-driven point of view, wherein you'll decide who lives and dies. This will affect either a soft or a hard choice going forward. Soft choices are those that basically alter things or change it in the short run, but don't affect the overall story. The Telltale games make use of a lot of soft choices while a hard choice will define or set you down a specific path, and there's no coming back from it. So this is if you decide to side with so-and-so or somebody else, and then that person is your ally for the next chapter. Hard choices create those variants when it comes to, or I'm sorry, the permutations when it comes to a story-driven experience. With that said, for a lot of video games, the trying to decide how morality is best used tends to, I'm sorry, has evolved since Bioware really pushed it forward. The original version was the idea of morality sliders. This is where every action in the game is weighted, obviously, on a scale of good to evil. You do something good, the slider goes up. You do something bad, it goes down. And what happens is, as you hit certain thresholds on that bar, different things may unlock or change. Maybe if you get to this point, your guy will like glow like a white aura around his head. And when he gets down here, he'll get like devil eyes or stuff along those lines. And this was the basic idea of trying to implement morality when it comes to gameplay and the player's decisions. The problem and what's kind of become the heart of this issue when it comes to morality in video games is that it is so abstracted, it really doesn't mean anything when it comes to actual morality in a gameplay decision. Because when you're trying to define a player's power or what they can and can't do, the second you have that kind of min-maxing, any sense of morality goes out the window. And the reason is that, as we've talked about before, there is an unwritten contract when it comes to playing a video game. We know we are playing a make-believe world. We know the stuff that happens in... Um, I don't know, uh, Hellraiser or Clyde Barker's The Undying is not going to happen here. Or having to fight demons in Devil May Cry, or you name it, pick any game. And because of that, once you begin to try and throw in a sense of morality, it doesn't work. Because if you tell me that the best power is X, and let's say that's only on the good side, then every player is going to try to get their morality to that specific point and go forward. What's worse is if you try to create two different play styles and one is ultimately more optimal, or one is actually not balanced around the game, whether 
it being too good or too bad. This also works if you're trying, or this doesn't work when you're trying to instill a lesson or something to the player. For instance, Undertale may be a very celebrated indie title, but the morality system doesn't really work at past your first play. Even though the game will try to point out how bad you are for going back to see the genocide route, or for going pacifist the second time, it, <coughs> oh, excuse me, it kind of falls on deaf ears at that uh, situation because I know I'm playing a video game. I know I'm doing this to explore the game systems. That's the whole point of when we're playing video games like that to figure out what is we can do and then see every option. Now, as morality sliders or as morality began to evolve, the next idea was to tie specific actions or have the player make a choice that will determine how easy or hard the game is. And this is, again, kind of the evolution. This is when instead of just saying you're going to be good or evil, we're going to say that if you want to make the game easier, you're going to go the bad route. Because that's what a lot of developers tend to do. It's always bad is easy, good is hard. And this is when we start to get into games that will try and tie uh, the player's power level to what they can, and or I'm sorry, to their morality. And this takes us to Vampire. In Vampire, everything is weighed by your experience. The more experience you get, the more you can upgrade. The more you upgrade, the higher your level will be and fights will become easier. But the only or the easiest way to get experience is to kill the named NBCs, and that's obviously the evil route. And the whole idea is, do you suffer for less power, but you're a better person, or do you go the vampire side and kill everybody, and you may throw in more enemies, but you're going to be a lot stronger. The problem with this kind of setup again, goes back to the abstracted nature of morality. If I'm just dealing with experience, then it's not really a good or evil thing because eventually I'm going to have the experience I need and then what happens if I just do all good stuff from that point forward? And that takes us to one of the biggest problems, trying to represent how the player is in relation to what the, play to the character is doing. In Bioshock, for instance, Everyone remembers the infamous ending choice, or how if you kill one uh, little sister, you're ultimately evil. You're bad, you're going to take over the world. If you don't kill them, then you are the greatest human being ever made. But again, the problem is that doesn't represent real morality. And we've talked about this before when it comes to Shades of Grey. Some people will do the right thing for the wrong reasons, just as they'll do the wrong thing for the right reason. For instance, in Vampire, maybe you're trying to level up to the point so you can save everybody, and you have to kill someone to get that power you need. But most video games don't explore that. They keep it to very specific actions or very specific responses to your actions. So that if you do X, no matter whatever you do after that, you may still be considered good or evil. Going back to the morality slider issue, what many RPGs or games did with that was usually about a quarter to maybe a sixteenth of the way to the end of the game, they will do something like, if your morality is at this point or higher, you will always get the good path. If it's at this point or lower, you will always get evil. And then the game will kind of shift or make all uh, remaining choices for you. Again, it's a very artificial way of trying to make the player care about what their actions do. Nothing says, you know, heartwarming and soul-crushing decisions like a choice saying plus five good points or plus five evil points. And this is why the games that tend to make the best use of morality, again, focus on the shades of gray, and more importantly, they do not tie explicit gameplay to those choices. So what that means is, yes, I'm going to choose an option. It could be good, it could be bad, but that will have no relation to how my character grows or becomes more powerful. Instead, that is usually done as a side effect of the quests and actions I make. So if I choose the good path, or the evil path, or the neutral path, I'm still going to get experience. I'm still going to be able to level up my character, but where I may go or who I'm going to deal with 
that is the part that changes. I want to adjust the camera here very slightly. And some of the best examples of this would be games like Deus Ex and the Witcher series. Now in The Witcher, again, we've talked about this one before, so I won't go too far into it. Geralt is a morally gray character. He's someone who will do whatever it takes if it satisfies what he's trying to accomplish, be it a good or evil route. And because of that, he tends to walk that line both ways. And ultimately what he does is usually best for the overall situation, but it may doom minor people or smaller groups of characters in the process. And again, he's never really, or at least in the first two Witcher games from what I played, it's never spelled out explicitly, you're good or you're evil. It's just the nature of what happened. In Deus Ex, for instance, all the morality choices of how you help people, who you keep alive, what actions you do, doesn't directly relate to your experience or to your gameplay. Solving a quest one way will still get you experience rather than solving another. The story will change. Certain actions or areas may become inaccessible to you, but your path through the game can be handled by multiple approaches. This is why a lot of people like Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines by the fact that you can play that game any which way you choose, and as long as you preserve the Masquerade and don't give in to the beasts, you can do what you want. Do you want to kill someone after you finish their quest? Go for it. Do you want to be a crazy person who talks to inanimate objects? Why not? And again, what they do is, instead of tying progression to your choices, they just tie the solutions. So, if I complete a quest, whether it's non-violently, a bloodthirst killing, or some crazy alternative, I'm still getting experience. And the experience is abstracted, so it's just like common knowledge. It's not like I'm getting good experience, bad experience, stuff along those lines. Now, some games will try, and I guess this will be our wrap-up point, some series try to tie morality again into the grander scheme of things, but keeps it as far removed from the actual gameplay as possible. And that's what some of the Shin Megami Tensai games have done. Their games always deal with the ideas of lawful, chaotic, and neutral, and the philosophies behind them. And you are never really, again, forced down one path. You can choose what you want, and some of these games will try and tie some gameplay benefit to it. But again, you run that risk. If you tie bonuses or abilities to, let's say, a choice, and you don't tell the player what choices influence that morality, what could happen is the player builds themselves up, let's say, all lawful bonuses and perks, they have all the gear associated to it, they'll make a choice right before a boss, and let's say that moves them down to neutral, and all of a sudden all their gear and abilities no longer work. And again, that's why you got to be careful when morality gets tied to gameplay. Because it becomes false in that case. Because you're not really thinking about, oh, am I going to make this person happy or sad? You're thinking about how it relates to your character. And when you do that, it's very hard to think about things, again, from a morality point of view. And some games, again, I think the best examples fall into those shades of gray or have the morality affect the story, but the gameplay remains largely unchanged or the player progresses through gameplay rather than through story-based decisions. Again, in the sense of them growing in power, not, you know, what areas they visit and stuff like that. But with that said, we're going to wrap things up here. For those of you watching this, other than the games I've mentioned, can you think of other great or poor examples of morality in video games? And are there cases where you feel that the morality maybe does have a major impact on how you play a game. For me, I try to always go the evil route first just to see where things will go in terms of how far developers will write that. But that's a subject for another time. So thank you so much for watching today's Critical Thought. Be sure to check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we examine the art and science of games. Until next time, have a great night. Before we get to the credits, just want to give a quick shout out to the fans and supporters over on patreon.com slash GWBicer. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check back around 10 Eastern for regular streaming. If you like suggest games for me to cover or topics to talk about, let me know in the comments below. For a collection of my writings as well as weekly podcasts on design, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the Game Wisdom Patreon, you can find us on there on patreon.com slash gwbicer. A dollar will get you into our private Discord channel where we talk game topics and more. Five dollars will get you voting privileges for any major event, including the Saturday Night Grab Bag, Patreon-funded goals, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoy more videos here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel.